Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Gerald Grunwald, Dean of the Jefferson College of Life Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome our Textile, Philadelphia University, and Jefferson alumni, as well as our additional guests and current students, faculty, and staff, to the latest in our ongoing series of events during our Jefferson College of Life Sciences anniversary celebration. Tonight, we are here to honor and to hear from Dr. Marcel Martinez, the inaugural recipient of the Jefferson College of Life Sciences Alumni Association's Early Career Alumni Award. Marcel, we are very proud of you and your accomplishments, and we look forward to hearing your story about your journey with us and since your time as our student and now as our alumnus. I want to extend my thanks to the JCLS Alumni Association Board, our Jefferson Office of Alumni Affairs and Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations, Jeffrey Spence, for supporting tonight's event and of course, as well to all of our alumni for your dedication and support of our university, college, programs, students, and faculty. As you will learn in a moment when she is fully introduced, Marcel Martinez is in fact a double alumnus of Jefferson, of our Life Sciences East Falls Campus Biochemistry Undergraduate Program, as well as our Center Cities College of Pharmacy PharmD program. As I indicated last week when I discussed the history of our combined university, we are one Jefferson, and we are building bridges between our campuses, programs, students, faculty, and alumni. Thus, Marcel's journey perfectly represents this theme. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Jeffrey Ashley, Professor of Chemistry in our Department of Biological and Chemical Sciences in our College of Life Sciences, who will introduce our awardee. Jeffrey? Thanks, Jerry, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening on this special occasion. First, I would like to say happy 50th birthday to Jefferson College of Sciences. On that vein, many thanks to Dr. Jerry Gwenwald for providing just over two weeks ago, Jerry. I think it was a fascinating historical narrative on the college's existence from its birth to uh, half a century ago to present day. As a 20 plus veteran of the East Falls faculty, it's a true pleasure to be part of such a vibrant and diverse college. And I look forward to many more years of innovative academic evolution. Lastly, before we start, I want to thank both Jerry Grunwald and Jeff Spence uh, for the privilege of introducing tonight's award-winning speaker. So let's begin. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. I'm hoping that you can see that. Uh, Dr. Marcel Martinez, or Marcel Vasquez, as we knew her as an undergraduate, came to the chemistry biochemistry program via a change of major form in her freshman year, believe it or not. Beginning as an interior designer major, Marcel's interest in science and health prompted what we will hear tonight as one of the many shifts in paths that she took. Having taught over 3,000 undergrads over the two decades, there are many students that fall into the dark recesses of my brain, to be truthful. Um, not Marcel, though. I still remember the exact room and the exact spot that she claimed as hers in my freshman chemistry class 16 years ago. And truthfully, I still recall grading all of her tests first so I could rest assured that my answer key was correct. As an upper level student, Marcel took instrumental methods of analysis. I was her instructor. This is where her intelligence, her unwavering motivation and her constant curiosity collided wonderfully and productively before my eyes. I got to witness a rising star in the making. In this course, she chose to complete a research project that looked at the timely and novel issue of formaldehyde in imported clothing. Mixing the disciplines of chemistry, toxicology, and even business, she presented her findings at a local conference, and they were very well met. We later had a chat about how she could get even more research experience. Consequently, she applied for and was awarded a prestigious NSF REU summer grant to conduct research at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Marcel conducted research on a NOAA C grant funded project that summer and was hired to continue her work by the Academy in the years to follow. For many long hours and very many hot hours, I would say in the field collecting samples to many long hours in the lab, she amassed a large impressive data set and a deep understanding of an emerging set of contaminants within the highly contaminated ecosystem that we know locally as Tinica Marsh. Marcel was awarded a travel award to attend and present her research at the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry in Tampa, Florida, a venue that sees only a handful of undergraduate research presentations, again, attesting to the caliber of the research that she was performing. From there, Marcel was essentially 
uh, it was essential in the production and eventual publication of her research at the Academy of Natural Sciences. She can even say that she's a cover girl now because the journal she chose to publish in highlighted the research on their cover. Upon graduation with her BS cum laude in biochemistry, Marcel worked as an analytical chemist from nonprofit organizations such as the Academy of Natural Sciences to a suite of chemical and biochemical industries. She entered the newly founded PharmD program at a little medical college named Thomas Jefferson. You might've heard of it. She graduated in May, 2015. In the past five years, she has seen her undergraduate institution merge with her graduate school. Who would have thought, right, Marcel? Her experiences and degrees from both of these institutions attest to the powerful additive nature that the merger of TJU with Philly U brought about. Marcel represents the rare student that maximized her learning experience, both undergrad and grad, by exploring, by exploring exciting tangential paths of learning and discovery before committing to her career choice. Tonight, please join me in congratulating Dr. Marcel uh, Martinez as the inaugural recipient of the, this is a mouthful, Jefferson College of Life Science Alumni Association's Early Career Alumni Award. Awesome. Dr. Martinez's presentation this evening, appropriate, appropriately titled, entitled, My Unconventional Journey from Chemist to Healthcare Professional, will include her reflections on the beginning of her career and highlight her early career work. I'm going to stop sharing and ask you, Marcel, to take it away. Hi, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for the introduction. That was amazing. Hi, Dr. Dean Grunwald. Thank you so much for or orchestrating this. It's been pretty amazing. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeffrey Spence, and thank you for Dean Grunwald for organizing this event. Thank you for Jefferson um, College of Life Sciences alumni at the board for choosing me. And thank you so much, Dr. Ashley. Um, I really owe you my career for um, believing in me and pushing me along and giving me access to so much information that I found very useful for my career. So this is my unconventional journey. Um, it starts kind of interesting and then you guys will kind of understand some of why it's unconventional, at least for me. So please join me in celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month. Today's the last day. And with that, I was born in the Dominican Republic. Then I moved to Camden, New Jersey when I was only eight years old. And to me, that was a pretty significant part of my life because I felt my life at the time in the Dominican Republic was pretty good. Um, uh, I was in private school. I had a nanny. I had um, private insurance. So things were good. And then when we moved to Camden, New Jersey, it was a little different for me. Um, and that was kind of the basis of my goal in life. At the time, it was like, I am going to go to school and I am going to get out of this town. I am never coming back to Camden because it was so, it was a very interesting experience for me to say nonetheless. So then I'm going to start with my high school education because I think that was important in how I got to, um, to fill a year. To me, it's still fill a year. Uh, I went to a technical, technical school in Pensacola in Camden County Tech. At the time, Camden City Schools are not pretty good. And technology was pretty much advancing at the time. And I felt like, hey, I need to do something with technology and I love to draw. So I decided to do computer aided design. Um, I knew nothing of architecture at the time, but I went along with it. Eventually I succeeded. I became the first certified drafter to um, accomplish this my junior year of high school. The other other students had to take the test multiple times, but I passed the first time and I competed in some competitions. So I did architectural drafting and I got first place in the state of New Jersey. So then that got me to Kansas City to compete. I didn't get nowhere near first place, but it was still an amazing experience. I competed again the following year and I still got third place and something else, but pretty much related. And then I was valedictorian. So this time, this is as good as it gets for Pentech. I thought I was pretty well prepared. I knew what I was going to do. And it was just a matter of getting there. So then I applied to Philly U for the architecture program. And I got accepted, um, which I know not everyone did at the time. The only issue at the time was I didn't have money for the deposit to give it right away. And I got a call within a few weeks like, hey, the program's closed. Um, but I fell in love with Philly U. I loved the campus and the commute was great. Even though I lived on campus the freshman year, I wanted to be able to save a little bit of money by 
um, still living with my mother at the time. So I went with my number two, which was interior design. Maybe I should have taken that as a hint. So then my freshman year was pretty crazy. I did a lot of soul searching because I was failing things left and right. I noticed that I was not prepared for college. Um, I did not know how to study because I didn't have to study in high school. It was, it, everything came so easily to me then. And especially in my seminar paper class, the teacher brought me to the side and she's like, you don't belong in my class. And that was a pretty traumatic experience for someone coming in and going through everything that I went that I was like, no, I'm going to pass this class. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that is because I did reach out to professors. I went to tutoring um, and I took all the benefits that Phil U at the time had to help us succeed. And I passed all these classes. I ended up getting a B in every single one of them, especially in physics. So that was pretty traumatic. I started with a 37 and then I got a 97 on my second exam. But then I noticed I was not very creative. I lacked any creativity. If you come to my home, you'd think that I was still moving in. Um, so then I moved away from design and then I looked into the job outlook and it wasn't great. So I didn't even have that drive anymore. And during my falling water project, I was supposed to design a, a visitor center and I just kept falling more and more behind. So at the time I was like, okay, I don't think this is working out. So actually the first person I went to see was Dr. Ashley um, as the first year advisor. And he kind of gave me some information on how I can make the transition. And so I did. And then it was just a matter of what I wanted to do. So now I felt like I was so confused. Um, do I do pharmacy back? Because that's what I wanted to do when I was in middle school, believe it or not. And I just needed something. So I took biochemistry. I thought it was a strong degree to get me going. It's a nice, strong base. And it had better job outlooks depending on what I picked. And then the question was, why stay at Philly It's a private institution, it's out of state. And then reality was the same reason why I went to Philly in the first place. I love the campus, the class sizes were small and I, was, I thought I was gonna be able to get a pretty good hands-on experience. And then the commute wasn't about as long as I left early from my house. So then time management. So I didn't wanna have what happened my freshman year. I wasn't gonna start failing courses, but I needed to work. So I was very judicious with my time. I did not join any organizations. And believe it or not, I didn't even see a basketball game, which is pretty sad because we were pretty good at the time. But I just felt like I had to focus on studying. I had to work on the weekends. And I did do um, some stuff at school. So I did the cafeteria part of my financial aid package. But then I was a lab prep for the two years before I graduated. And then the one thing that I did focus on was some of the friendships and the study groups because they helped me um, stay positive and help me stay on track. And then now we get to some of the experiences. So I was recommended to go up to the honors program. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. Um, so that gave me the opportunity to upgrade my classes and get some experiences. I upgraded my chemistry honors with Dr. Ashley. So I was able to learn how to use the gas chromatography. I learned about organic pollutants. And then I also upgraded my biochemistry course with Dr. Wilkinson. So that gave me some gene expression um, experience. I will show you in a little bit on Drosophila or basically fruit flies. And then the formaldehyde study that Dr. Ashley discussed. So this is a gas chromatography. So the basis of it, a sample gets injected, it gets burned, it goes through a column and is pushed by it with a carrier glass. Typically um, helium could be nitrogen or hydrogen, but that's pretty scary. Um, so it gets pushed through the column and they get separated based on size. And you go through a detector that gives you a signal of how much and essentially you can figure out what once you get it calibrated. And then for my biochemistry honors, this is the, it's a little poster that I did. I don't remember presenting this. It was mostly for the honors. Um, but it was interesting in that we can start um, like affecting how proteins get transmitted and how they can be silenced in DNA. Um, the most important thing I did with this every morning, really early in the morning, I had to go to the lab and I had to go through um, the Petri dishes and find the flies that were just born. So I can pick out the virgin female flies because those were the ones that we were going to meet and hopefully try to see how the protein went down the chain. Right, and this is the study on the formaldehyde. 
um, and imported apparels. I did have Kelly to do this with. Um, it was a pretty interesting study. And yes, there is formaldehyde in your fabrics, especially when you buy them from the store. So wash everything that you use, especially if you have sensitive skin. So there are more experiences. So Dr. Ashley did go over the research experience for undergraduates. So it was open nationwide. There was, I think a little over a hundred people applying for eight positions and I got one of the eight. Um, and this was obviously because um, upgrading my chemistry course and learning how to use a gas chromatography and learning about this pollutants was really important. So I got some presentations, some field work and analytical skills. I became a co-author in the publication and I had a day trip to Duke University. I don't know if he remembers me, but it was pretty awesome for me. Um, and then we went on to give the poster presentation at Seed Tech North American Annual Meeting in Tampa. Dr. Ashley was there and a few others from the academy, especially his son, who was really cute at the time. Um, and this is actually the only time I went to Florida, which is pretty sad. I've traveled everywhere else except Florida. It's the only experience I have. And then lastly, so there was a Rush University Multicultural Enrichment Program. So that was in Chicago, and that was facilitated by Dr. Diana Condell and Dr. Brendan Francis, who was a previous Philly U alumni. So I spent a week uh, in Chicago. We went over medical cases. We um, toward the anatomy lab, so the cadavers are a lot better, sorry, school, um, and I did a tour of the surgical ward. So the thing about this presentation is just try to get a different group of people, of students, and um, show them what we can do in the healthcare, because it's not just medicine, there's a lot of other things. So this is the, um, the research that I did at the academy. I did get a little bit of buzz, so I ended up on the, this week at Philly U. I was interviewed by KYW. That was this picture of me trying to wrap a catfish. So if you don't take off the fin, it pierces right through the aluminum foil and that kind of um, screws up the samples later on because you have fish mis mixing with each other. And then the study that was publicized is at the bottom left. So what was about the study? So at the CTEC meeting, this is the poster presentation that Dr. Ashley was discussing. So there's these two chemicals, um, PBDEs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, and the PCVs, which are polychlorinated um, biphenols, it's the one at the top. So that's a chemical that was used heavily in the manufacturing industry. It was used in dielectric fluid. It was used because um, high boiling point, it was very stable. It was also used in um, like foam boards. Um, but what happened, this chemical ended up um, affecting neurodevelopment. It was cancer causing and it was all over the environment to the point that we still see it today. And this is important because the bottom chemical, the PVDE, looks very similar. And we found that it's behaving very similar in the environment. So it's accumulating the same. You're finding this stuff everywhere in the water and the fish and the dirt, but we still use it and it's still used as a flame retardant. So it can be found in electronics or it can be found even in furniture. So this is a little bit about the Rush Medical College trip. Um, this was the case that we had to present. Um, it was hypercholesterolemia, which back then to me, I was like, what is that? I have no idea. And now I see it every day because now we're treating patients with cholesterol. And that's Kate. So she was a pre-med student also from Philly U and we found a Rams in Chicago. So we had to take a picture because that's our mascot. Okay, so beyond graduation. So I did all this. And believe it or not, I was still kind of confused because it was used so much. So I had a little bit of medical and I had um, some chemistry, but then we were also doing a great recession and that's kind of what's happening today. Um, so there were very poor job selections. A lot of it was temporary. Um, and you kind of, you just, I just went with it. You know, I'm gonna explain a little bit about that, but I knew my education was not over. And I had different options. So there was employment, then there was a graduate degree in environmental studies. And the reason why I did it, I wasn't sold on it was because I did not feel very fond of typing for long periods of time. So Dr. Ashley, all he did was type, type, type. And one of his coworkers, Dr. Delinsky, a type, type, type. And remember, I felt my first writing paper. So I was a little nervous about typing papers all day long. 
Um, and then I had the medical school. I like healthcare and I thought that would be a great path, but I did really bad on the MCATs. I took it twice. Um, I still applied though to a Caribbean medical school and I did get in, but then I, I chickened out. Um, I guess I wasn't sold. But yeah, so I went to get a job. As um, Dr. Ashley mentioned, I stayed at the Academy of Natural Sciences for a couple of years. Um, so that was pretty awesome, but the money obviously doesn't stay. They didn't have a full position for me. So I reached out and started looking for other positions while I worked at the Academy. So I worked at Mesa Bay before I graduated. I did it the summer and that was the worst job I had. Oh my goodness. Now, some of the things they did was quality control. And in that company, they did, they packaged food. So fruits that you will find at the supermarket, even at Starbucks. They also did, uh, I don't know now, but they also did the apples for the McDonald's Happy Meals. And they did uh, meatballs for Wawa and soups for Wawa. So it sounds pretty interesting, but I hate it. I did not want to look at people, whether they were wearing the right stuff, checking temperatures. I thought it was just a waste of my degree. So I left that very quickly. And then finally, after applying everywhere, after I graduated, it took me three months, but I got a job working for Gold Colgate at the compounding center. So there we made flavors and fragrances. So flavors, um, they go in toothpaste, very popular for Colgate. And then some fragrances like Fabuloso or some of the fragrances that go in the deodorant were made here. Now I was hired because they had three grass gas chromatography and I was responsible for the maintenance of all three of them. Um, so when quality is waiting to approve a chemical to go out the door and I'm delaying the process was a little stressful, excuse me. But then eventually there was a research and development position that opened up and that was in Piscataway, New Jersey. So a little further up. So my, well, my current husband, he was my boyfriend at the time, he pushed me, he's like, let's do this, we'll move. I moved out of my house at this time, we got this job at Colgate and it was great initially. Um, and then those jobs kind of trickled down a little bit. So some of the things they do is there was a complaint on products. So we would check to make sure that the flavors and the fragrances in that product was what it's supposed to be in there. So we had to extract some of these oils from these products and then run them to the grass chromatography to make sure they were appropriate. We also tested if we were getting a new supplier for like mint oils, like um, peppermint or spearmint, we would test a large amount of batches to make sure they were all the same and they weren't manipulated in any way. Like you can add more menthol some of these oils to make it a little bit different. And then eventually there was a full-time position that opened up, but I guess I did really bad on my interview because I the, the manager thought that I could do more. He thought that I did not deserve to stay in that position. At Colgate doing the same stuff. So he did not give me the position based on that. He wanted me to go to school and to do more. So I was like, fine. Um, so then I saw the writing on the wall. I was not gonna stay because the other girl was there, so I left. Lucky for me, this experience is actually amazing in chemistry because I was hired almost immediately. I got a different job at Jevedon Court, which is way up in North Jersey. We only did flavors there. And we're talking about like Coke products, we're talking about um, vanilla extracts. And also like the Wendy's shake mixes were made here. And we just had to make sure that everything that went out was up to spec. Coke did not play. They were not going to take anything that was not made appropriately. But at this point in my life, I was like, no, I can do more. So then I left that place and I took a month off to study for my PCAT, which is a pharmacy entrance exam. And I did well, which is good. And then my boyfriend at the time, he pushed me. He's like, you know what? Don't worry about the car payments. Don't worry about the apartment payment, your student loan. I got you. Let's just do this. So then I did that. And then while I was applying, I looked for another position. So that was a firm inch. Excuse me. Firm inch. So that was just fragrances. So we're talking about um, fragrances for candles, for plugins, perfumes. And I started learning the differences between sensitive perfumes versus like a really fancy perfume like Oscar de la Renta. And the price does make a difference. So the ingredients that go into the better perfumes are better. 
if you buy something that's sensitive, does not mean that it's better or anything. It just means that it has more chemicals in it. All right, so then after that, I finally got into pharmacy school. So this was at Jefferson. At the time that we were not fully accredited, I was the fourth graduating class. But you know what? I think Jefferson knew what they were doing. They've been around for over 100 years. The medical school was, was decent, as you say. So I went with them. Um, and then at the same time, I got a job as an intern at, at Walgreens. And that was a weekend job. I felt like you always need experience. But then, then now, because I knew what I wanted to do, I was a little bit more, more active in the organization. So student body government, leadership life. And then I did poster competitions and the poster presentations never go away. So I did so two independent competitions. And that is my future goal. I do hopefully plan to own at least one pharmacy. And if you talk to my husband, he wants to own 20. So we'll see. And then around this time, before I graduated, I did get married. And we'll go back to that. And I did get a position offered by Walgreens for full-time pharmacists in the fall, which was interesting because I started spending money before I even had money. That's not a good, not good. So then my postgraduate life. So I had some interesting graduation gifts. So our graduation was on a Wednesday. We signed for a house on Friday. And I found out I was going to be a mother the following Tuesday. So there was just a lot going on. And because of student loans, I knew I was going to stay as a pharmacist. I was going to work full time. But a lot of us mothers, we get a lot of external influences about needing to stay home with your kids you know, breastfeed them to like their three and the PTA meetings and dance. And to be honest, that just did not fit in my schedule. I spent quality time with my daughter, but it was not those things. Um, but I still have, I'm still proud and everything worked out well. So my daughter the other day, I don't remember if she had a bug bite or a scratch. My mother-in-law who's a doctor was trying to help her. And my daughter, she's four. She said, no, my mommy is a pharmacist and she's going to make me feel better. So I, it was just, it was awesome. And I just look at my mother-in-law like, oh, that's what happens. And then the reason why I like the um, community pharmacy, so it's flexible. Yes, there's nights and weekends or holidays and all that. But as a parent, being able to say, hey, can you cover my shift tonight? You know, I'll open for you tomorrow or having the weekday off so you can schedule your visits. It was good. And because I started a pharmacy well before um, I graduated, I just had to work a year as a pharmacist and I qualified for four weeks of vacation through Walgreens, which is what I have now. All right. So how do we have this interest in transition? So back in the days, we knew the baby boomers were going to start retiring. So a lot of schools in the country went bam and started putting up pharmacy schools all over the place. Um, we didn't have enough pharmacists at the time, but now we have too many and now the pay is going down. And this is a little bit of maybe one of the reasons why. So now baby boomers are living longer, but they have more complex medical conditions. So a lot more expensive, like you guys see all those commercials, those medications are super expensive. So expenses are going up for patients and for payers. So payers include insurance companies, include employers. They can't afford all this. So now how insurance companies, including Medicare, have accommodated is they're decreasing the reimbursement. So now hospitals are getting hit. This is just two of them, but there's a lot of other things. So we have mission within 30 days of discharge and falls. If your hospital is high on those two measures, you're not gonna be getting compensated as well. And then how has this affected pharmacy? So now we have performance-based payments. So if your patients do not take their medication, then guess what? You're not getting paid. And it's just, I feel like it's wrong, but that's what we have. So we have something called a Medicare star rating, and it's different for different healthcare and organizations. So for Part C and Part D medical insurance plans, the better the rating, so like a five stars means patients are healthier, they're taking the medications, they're staying out of hospitals. And it's where you want to be. And you can probably charge more, more for your insurance plan. But if you, as a pharmacy, had lower adherence, you're bringing down these ratings for the insurance plan, so you're going to get paid less. And some of the ways they've done this is with this DIR fee, so direct and indirect remunerations. So basically, there's a lot that goes into this. 
insurances don't tell you when this is going to happen. They don't tell you, hey, you're going to give me some money because of this reason. Um, they just occurred. You don't have money to pay for your drugs because you have a DR fee, DIR fee. So what does this mean? They may charge you because you're in network. they will take a fee. And if you have um, poor adherence for your patients, they may take it off from the money they're supposed to pay you. So let's say they're supposed to give you $20 for this medication. They're like, ah, we'll give you 18. So now you're taking a loss of $2 for no reason. Other ways that this is effective. So there are some rebates that happen in the pharmacy industry to help keep the cost of goods down. But Medicare goes, oh, you got a rebate. I need to take some of that money back. So then now Medicare is also like taking more money away. So this has affected everyone, independent pharmacy, retail pharmacy, including Walgreens. So how has Walgreens responded? So they opened up this new position called Health Outcomes Pharmacist. It was originally created as a work from home, but in the state of New Jersey, we weren't allowed because of the Board of Pharmacy, some of the regulations. And it started as a pilot program. On day one, it was only 25 pharmacists. Um, and again, I had a really good position. I did not work Sundays. Saturdays, we closed at 4 p.m., but I felt like I needed more time with the girls. So this is how I started making a little bit of sacrifices at this point. So no weekends, no nights, no holidays, but I did take a 20% cut in my salary to do this. But I believed in this. I knew this is what we need in healthcare. And then when COVID came, then now I'm working from home. So now the Board of Pharmacy kind of sped up the approval. So we're finally like set up how we're supposed to set up. So this position is meant to improve the Medicare star rating for some of these paid for performance plans. Um, there's several. Before it was only like one in 2015, I believe, and now there's more than 20. And we are specifically just targeting high-risk patients, so diabetes, hypertension, or high blood pressure, and cholesterol. There's others that you can target. So you can also do HIV, you can do asthma, and some of the specialty medications, but this is what we're only focusing on. So we try to, re, um, when we call patients, we try to determine the barriers to adherence. So what does this mean? What prevents our patients from taking their medication? Is it because it's too expensive? Is it because they can't remember or they just don't know why they're taking medication? So we try to figure those out. To me, some of the hardest is cost. I can't really bring down the cost of their medication. But what I can do today is the first day of open enrollment for Medicare. So I can recommend them to go to the website or call some of the toll free numbers to help them pick a plan that will cover all their medications. So then next we have medication related problems. So some patients are taking prescriptions and they're experiencing side effects and they don't know. Um, I have patients tell me they're getting endoscopies done because they keep coughing and they're taking a medication that causes coughing. I have patients tell me they're in the emergency room getting x-rays because they have muscle pain and they're taking some of the strongest cholesterol medications, which are known to cause um, muscle pain. And then I also heard um, patients just not taking the medication. Oh, it makes me feel bad, so I don't take it anymore. It's like, okay. And then lastly, counseling. So some, I hate to have to throw some doctors under the bus, but some doctors are not counseling the patients appropriately. They're given, hey, you have diabetes, here's your prescription, go to the pharmacy and pick it up. And then they're expected to have patients know what diabetes is, how do they can get better and how to take their medication. Sure, we're available as a pharmacist, but when we ask our patients, hey, do you have any questions for me? No, I'm good. And they leave out the door and they don't know their medication. They get home and it's like, uh-oh. I had a lady tell me she had to take five medications. She was taking one medication, so one pill, um, one hour apart. So that was her morning at six, at seven, at eight, at nine. It's like, no, you don't have to do that. You can take them all at once. So I said, I started with 25 pharmacists. Now we have 197 pharmacists in the country. So before we used to service just about a quarter of the states, but now we're only, we're in every state, including Puerto Rico. Um, except two. So this shows you how well we've done. We're no longer a pilot program. And they last year, so before we even had a year mark in the program, they saw that patients that we just called um, and called them, right now we're calling them every week, which is a little sad, but they noticed that patients who received these constant calls were 7% more likely to refill medications. And, you know, that's kind of what we needed. 
And then this is a little bit of the flyer. So what do I do? Besides making phone calls and solving all these problems, I also do MTM, so medication therapy management. Um, so we will submit claims, for instance, if they're late to refill or if we need to give them a new um, therapy consultation. We also do CMRs, which is a comprehensive medication evaluation, which is a little bit longer. Yesterday, I was on the phone with the lady for an hour ended up leaving late, but um, she needed it. She's like, oh my God, I don't know what any of this is. She was telling me she was diagnosed with um, heart disease. So coronary artery disease, she was taking anticoagulants. She was taking medications for chest pain. She was taking a ton of stuff. And it turned out that she only had acid reflux. And now she understood why every time she took like Tom's or something, she felt better. I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. So she really appreciated the call. And then we also try to push some of our um, our programs to save a trip to coordinate their refills or 90 days. Um, So they can come to the pharmacy every three months instead of every single month in automatic refills. But some of these things are kind of challenging for my patient population. A lot of them are at least over 60, 70, 80. So we even had a 102 year old patient um, for one of my colleagues, they don't do some of this electronic. They don't know how to do text messages. They don't know email. So when I talk about some of these things, I have to be judicious and offer the service that I feel is going to help them. Because if I give them too much, they're going to end up saying, this is not working. Walgreens doesn't know how to free fill my medication. I'm going to leave. So I don't try to offer them everything. But then lastly, for advice. And so one thing that works for me is SMART goals. So simple, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. Um, so what does that mean? Don't tell me you want to become a millionaire in the future, but you're making $30,000 a year and you don't have a side hustle. Like you're never going to get there. Um, but maybe you want to have $10,000 saved in a year or in two years. So that's a little bit more attainable. And I think having a vision board is very is an interesting way. I just got that email from one of my supervisors. I'm like, I'm totally doing that. So the next, the short term goal that I have, it's kind of silly, but again, I haven't been to Florida besides the Tampa trip. I'm going to take my daughters to Disney World in two years. So my youngest will be three and I'm going to go all out. So I need to make sure I have the money for that because I heard it's kind of pricey. And then you always need to have positive influences, including your employment. So I sneaked in there by my husband and from here and there. You need someone that's going to help you become a better you. If you have someone who's telling you you're never going anywhere, you're a horrible person, that's not going to work. And I know some of these people are family members, but they're not good for you. And you kind of just need to figure out, walk away, and then take a risk, especially with an employer. If you have a job that you want, you tell your boss that you want the job and you think you're giving it your all and you still don't get that job promotion. Now, so what is the issue? Talk to your your manager. Can you do something different? Or maybe it's time for a new job or a new position. Because So I'm 34 years old. I have a very long time for retirement. If I'm going to do something that I don't like and that I hate, this is going to be a really bad 30 years before I can retire. Then another thing that I find very important is a work-life balance. So they're going to affect each other. If you're working a lot and you come home and your kids don't know you, is that really what you're looking for? Um, So my husband used to travel for work, not so much because of COVID. And he would come home and my daughter was always attached to me. She wanted nothing to do with my husband. Well, guess what? I work weekends. I work some nights. So when I was working, my husband was taking care of my daughter. And he created a very strong bond with those moments that he was by himself. And then on the contrary, I know people who are like, well, I'm just going to take care of my kids. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But then don't complain to me later on that you don't have a job because you don't have work experience. So you have to kind of balance and be happy with your balance. And then lastly, so health outcomes. So believe it or not, I'm a pharmacist. I hate taking medications. I can't remember to take them and I don't want you to take them either. Um, So I push every single one of my patients that I speak with, balanced nutrition. So vegetables, fruits, lean protein, try to make small changes now so that you can live longer. We're talking about blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. That helps. Eating well helps, trust me. And then exercising most days of the week, and adequate sleep. You need to charge your batteries. And I'm not talking about four or five hours. Short term, fine, but seven to eight hours is best. 
And with the exercise, uh, I don't need to lose weight. I actually have a hard time gaining weight, but I still work out four days a week because I need my bones to be as strong as they can. And I need to be as strong as I can. So when I'm 80 years old, I'm still unstoppable. And this is how you get there. And then lastly, your mood and stress relief. So I know now with COVID, this has been highlighted a lot. And if you're having issues with anxiety or depression, don't go and take a prescription. Don't go and take something. Talk to someone and find something that's going to help you relieve some stress. So for me, I like gardening. Again, you know, environmental thing. I want, um, I got a greenhouse. I would get one one day. And that is how I, you know, relieve stress. And I love it. So then this is sort of my timeline. So you have to remember your personal life, your private life. I started in 2004, I feel like you. And then now to today, we have combined Jefferson and I'm getting this award. So thank you very much. And try to manage your goals. If something's coming up. So in 2013, my husband got an apartment in Boston because he got a promotion. We were like, oh, this is cool. But then one of our long-term goals was to have a family. Him traveling every week, and me working nights and weekends was not going to work. We needed to be close to home. So we gave that apartment up. We came back to Philadelphia, or the Philadelphia area, really. And my mother-in-law and my mother have been instrumental to help me with the girls. They both work full time. So it's, you know, a little bit helps, believe it or not. And don't forget, it's all about your home, how you feel, and having a good experience at work. And making it feel like it's not a chore. And then that's the last slide. So Camille's on the left. She's four. I'm a baby Elise. She's 16 months. And the bottom picture is the baby's first Easter, but it was COVID and there was no photography open. So this is how we celebrate it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. And we can do some questions and answers now. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. And thank you for, for sharing your, your journey and your professional and academic journey. Congratulations again on the Career Alumni Award. We're very excited um, to hopefully present it in person to you at our next um, Alumni Day. We now have some time for a few time for questions. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. And we have some that have already um, come in. Um, Dr. Martinez, you, you spoke about uh, the, the impact of prescription drug costs on your patients and your client base. Um, one of our guests wonders, you know, your thoughts on whether a single payer system or reforms to the insurance uh, programs would help to create a more transparent cost system. It's a good question. I have thought about that a lot. And I think it's, I don't know. So my one thing I'm thinking as a single payer, you're going to have a large um pool on how much you pay. So if you're the only payer, you may not be paying your doctors and your pharmacists as much as maybe they think they deserve. And I think this is bigger in the medical field because you have a lot of different doctors, a lot of specialties, and they take different insurances based on um, acceptability and, and um, reimbursements. So if everyone has the same low reimbursement, I don't know how great quality of healthcare would be. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you. And um, another question is really just reflecting back, you, you've taken time to reflect back on your career path and the, and the choices and, and lessons that have led you here. Um, is there a single lesson that you can point to that really has, has driven you and, and impacted your decision making? I think some of my early career, like early life, so personal life. Um, one of the things that I try with my daughters, I try to help them be completely prepared and not have to miss anything. And not that I didn't miss anything, but like my Christmas is weren't as great. Um, we didn't have like a Christmas tree full of things. So my drive and my determination was getting something, being able to give back to my daughters. And it's not probably not the best excuse, but I just had that as my drive, my experiences growing up. I wanted to do the very best that I could. 
And I wanted to have a good life for myself and for my daughters. And now, like, if I have a job where they're just not giving me what I want, I'm just going to find something else. Excellent. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this question is, did you feel pressure from your family um, to follow a career that paid the most despite your interest? If so, how did you deal with it? So I actually had, I, when I talked to my dad, who I find out went to pharmacy school for a very short period of time, he actually told me, can you find something easier? And I was like, what? Like, like you know that I graduated and I have a bachelor's degree. And he thought pharmacy was too difficult to do something else. So for me, going to pharmacy school wasn't so much about the money. It was about doing something that I loved, that I, um, that I would enjoy and get a lot out of. Going to school, I paid for my entire education. So I had a lot of student loans. And having, I had to take, get a job that was obviously going to pay my student loans back so that I was able to complete some of my goals. Cool. And then you have, and, and we're very to see what you do next. Yeah. We're very proud of you here at Jefferson. Thank you. So thank you and thank uh, Dr. Ashley and Dr. Grunwald and for everyone who attended uh, this evening. Uh, we hope that you'll join us next week uh, for a lecture by our Distinguished Alumni Award recipient, Dabrowski Herbert, uh, which will be next Thursday, 7 p.m. And then on Friday, November 6th, the JCLS Alumni Association is sponsoring a webinar focused on the vaccine race, which will feature Dr. Matthias Schnell uh, from Jefferson's Vaccine Center and Hanukkah Schademaker from Janssen's Global Pharmacy, a uh, Global Vaccine Development Center. We also invite you to consider supporting today's students, uh, students like Dr. Martinez, through uh, our scholarship initiative at jefferson.edu slash reimagine scholarships. Currently, Johnson & Johnson is offering a one-to-one -one match on donations received through the site. You can make your gift at any time and you can designate it to any area of the university that you wish. Thank you all once again for joining us and have a great night.